the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dimensional Fund Advisors, ABN 46065 937 671, ASFL 238093, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. This series is brought to you by Dimensional Fund Advisors, a global leader in systematic investing. Since 1981, Dimensional has been applying financial science to investing and supporting financial professionals with time-tested solutions they can count on. The benefits of Dimensional investing can be accessed in a wide range of vehicles, from managed funds to ETFs to model portfolios. Dimensional works with financial professionals to deliver better results and help them grow successful, client-focused businesses through investment, client communication and business strategy support. We call it Dimensional 360. Well, good morning and welcome back to another episode of the Ensemble Podcast. Uh, my name's Brendan Vade and I'm joined here today by Paul Turner, Head of Advisor Group uh, for Australia and New Zealand. That's right. Correct. That is correct. At Dimensional. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, we have been talking, and this is the fourth and final episode on a brilliant topic about the value of advice. Mm -hmm. And we're exploring different elements that the advisors play in that. And hopefully, our audience is sort of learning and developing their own knowledge about how to be better advisors and help give clients better outcomes. So, as part of that, you know, we wanted to spend this last episode exploring what is it that clients really want, which sort of reminds me of another question that I'm not very good at answering, but yeah. <laughs> hopefully this one's slightly easier to, to answer. Paul, I'd, I'd love to start with uh, maybe why, why you, Dimensional has something to say about this. Yeah, it's a good question. It is a simple question, isn't it? Um, what do clients want? But it's, you know, has a lot of different answers. But we, uh, as a firm, we've been working with financial advice firms globally for about 30 years now. So we've worked with, um, many, many firms of various sizes over a long period of time. Um, so we've learned a lot about seeing how they communicate and the things that have worked in, in their worlds, trying to, you know, at the end of the day, create a great, exceptional experience for a client while still running a business and then all those sort of things. So we've got a body of work that spans about three decades and we've got some pretty good insight as to what that looks like. Yeah, excellent. Is there any place that you'd like to start when you think about the value of advice? What, what stands out to you uh, in your research around what makes for good advice, what makes for good advice relationships? You know, can, can you put a bit of color on that from what you're seeing? Yeah, I'll put a bit of color on it and I'll, I'll it really comes down to viewing things from the client's perspective. Um, and that kind of sounds very simple, but, um, you know, we all work in financial services, wealth, wealth management, financial planning. We have a lens as to what that looks like from our particular roles. <laughs> we don't always sit on the other side of the table. Um, and, you know, advice firms that position their value and the outcomes that they provide to clients in a way that makes sense to the client really you know, have way way better and more enduring conversations and which really at the end of the day help clients you know get the outcomes they want i think the way that we think about that as a as a relationship with the firms that we have you know as i said we've been working with firms for about 30 years you know globally in australia we've been working down here with firms for about 25 years so we have a very good body of work as to what that looks like we have packaged up a lot of our learnings and really it's a lot of it is observations of, of best practice around these sort of things and you know, we're a fund manager so we're pretty good at managing investments but the investment piece is an important part to um, delivering a good um, client experience I'm not going to delve into what that investment philosophy looks like but you know, critically important is, is communicating um, value to clients um, when we talk about communication done well it is a very big differentiator for advisors out in the marketplace um, often we're very busy we talk about what we do and we stay in our lane and again it's pretty easy to forget what is the client hearing and what is their kind of knowledge they have coming into the conversation uh, I'm probably showing my age here I've went to school quite a long time ago and I know when I went to school in high school there was no 
education around finance, investing, financial planning, but, you know, you go out into the workforce and, you know, you get your casual jobs and you're probably given some sort of superannuation fund and then as you, as you, you know, go on your, your professional journey, you're kind of forced to invest in, in some respects, but you typically most people don't have the requisite knowledge to want to understand really what they're doing, the, the, the decisions they're making or the outcomes of those decisions. So mm. I think communicating in a way that simplifies what that experience is like and the benefits it brings i think we find often that advisors talk about the tools at their disposal rather than what they're trying to achieve and the benefit so they talk about the how you know, they talk about the how not about the why or the benefit the third thing um that we've we've undertaken as a business is what we call um, a business strategy and there's kind of two studies that that we run um, where we invite our clients being financial advisor firms right around the world to participate in global advisor studies and investor surveys. And those two studies really give a lot of insight as to how can we ensure we're creating better relationships between financial advisors and investors. So there's a lot of work that um, we have done on that. There's a lot of findings that we'll talk about today around client value propositions, what advisors, or what clients look for in an advisor from their own perspectives and some of the communication techniques and things that advisors should be doing to really help clients understand the benefits of that relationship. Yeah, right. Um, that sounds excellent because I guess it's something that everyone tries to pick up from their own experience, but that's not the same thing as asking, I guess, thousands of investors from around the world and directly asking you know, what it is that they're after yeah. and, and those sorts of things, yeah, that, I guess. that's right. When I talk about the investor study, we run that every year. And I think at last count, there's about 20,000 and investors yeah, well. that, uh, you know, are communicating what they value um, from the, how many times they meet, how they want to be spoken to, what sort of information is important, what gives them peace of mind, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, um, you know, we, we talk about processes setting you free. A lot of advice firms create processes that work for them, but it doesn't always take into account, you know, the, the, the client experience. Um, so it's about creating processes that you know, deliver what clients are looking for at the end of the day. Well, Paul, you can probably cut this uh, episode really, really short and just give us, you know, the answer. <laughs> Presumably, you've asked twenty thousand people what it is that they want. Yeah, well, <laughs> what are the top three? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's interesting in terms of what what clients want. Um, you know, and that, well, I guess how do they how do they measure winning or mm-hmm. what? How do they how do they measure a good experience? Um, mm-hmm. And it's certainly not um, investment returns um, isn't something that springs to mind when it comes to um, the client proposition. Um, the number one thing that comes up time and time again is they want security and peace of mind. So hmm. I think it probably goes back to that first point around not having requisite knowledge about investing and financial planning and those sort of things. So they, they know there's problems to solve. They don't know what those what that looks like or what that journey looks like. Um, and typically, there's some sort of anxiety or uncertainty or, or fear around what the future holds when it comes to kind of their, their financial um, lives. They want people to really understand their own, you know, they want advisors to understand their personal situation, um, you know, and be comforted that they, that the people they're working with kind of understand the stage of life they're in, the type of profession they're in, some of the challenges and benefits, and perhaps looking at um, maybe challenges in a different different light so bringing information to them and, and uncovering um, blind spots they might have mm. that, um, that makes a world of sense right because yeah. you, you got to imagine that clients aren't looking at things through a technical optimization lens and even when you can you still need to trade those off against sort of real world well is that something that i want to have now and run the risk of not having later or is it that important to me that i you know want to run that risk or not you know, all of those sorts of trade-offs yeah. come into the mix, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, you know, what you mentioned there, n- none of that was centered around investment performance or investment outcome, mm-hmm. although that is an important part of a plan because yeah. know, there's objectives that um, people are trying to meet. But it's certainly, you know, we set up a plan and, and we know advisors that listen and learn and then provide advice have way better relationships, way longer relationships because, you know, you set up a plan now and, you know, people get married, they get divorced, they get remarried, they buy houses, they move into state, they change jobs, they have illness, things change. Mm. Um, so they want a relationship where that is taken into account. They want to feel heard and, and you know, they measure progress in, in different ways. You know, value propositions that advisors bring to the table, you know, a good value proposition 
can really help differentiate one firm from another. And it's it really is a summary of why a client might choose an advisor. Can you give me an example of that? Is there something that springs to mind? Or yeah, I think as as you know, as a concept, if you think about a value proposition, a strong value proposition. I see talk about um, the benefit the relationship brings to the client, and that's more client friendly language. So it's simplifying people's financial lives. It's providing certainty in an uncertain world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it talks about problems they're trying to solve, and that can be some sort of thing they're saving for, something that they're trying to achieve, might be estate planning, insurance, and, and various other things. So they want to look after their families. You know, They want to make sure that they've got things in place should something go wrong or something unforeseeable go wrong. Um, and a value proposition should be around well, what is it that the financial advice firm um, has or offers that's different to someone else. I think where um, where a and I'm starting a value proposition because it leads into a lot of the other things um, mm. that we'll talk about today is a lot of value propositions focus on how we do things, so how advisors do things, not mm. why they do things. And, mm. and clients are interested in the why. You know, why do you do cash flow budgeting? You can do cash flow budgeting, but what, mm. what's the purpose? You know, so it's about thinking about those tools that are at your disposal and putting it into a way that is – that creates a feeling for a client. Mm. So, yeah, cash flow budget, budget is important, but what does it do? It provides certainty. It provides... Sure doesn't provide a feeling of excitement. No, I mean, that's not something doesn't. that's coming to mind. No, 100%. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's, it's, if, if we can have conversations that elicit an emotion, um, you know, people are going to be more confident. They don't need technical um, information if they're feeling something. If they're feeling less stressed, less anxious, more excited, more positive... Yeah, they're all things that are really important and that's what clients are looking for. And that's mm. typically, again, how they measure value. Mm. The other things that, um, you know, easy, easy to fall into, and I do it, in the, you know, at, at Dimensional, we have a pretty um, sophisticated investment proposition that we try to make very simple when we're talking to end investors, but we talk in industry language, not client language. So, yeah. again, we can be talking about all the things that we know and it's great to, you know, to have many years of experience and educational background and all those sort of things. But at the end of the day, how do we convey things simply and in mm. a way that makes sense? And again, at least it's the, the emotional response that clients want. It sounds easier, but I have seen things where um, advisors will list all the tools at their disposal, um, all the different strategies at their disposal, and then try to put that into a way that talks to an emotion or a feeling that they're trying to convey. So if you get your estate planning in place, what ultimately is it trying to do? It's trying to make sure that your family looked after when you may be gone, those sort of things. So putting it in a way, you know, what, what is it but why is it important? Yeah. That, that's what clients are looking for. And the final one is, um, is the measurement. You know, we, we tend to, in financial services and, and wealth management, typically measure in numbers and quantitative you know, quantitative outcomes rather than how are people feeling, you know, a year or two or three years into a relationship, are they feeling better? Are they feeling more positive? Yes, we need financial investment outcomes, you know, to, to achieve things that we need to achieve, but all those things that I kind of mentioned earlier, are they being met? So, you know, there's some, some of the pitfalls, but then some of the things to kind of change, it's really around changing the conversation mm. to be around feelings because that's what people are typically getting advice about. It's some <laughs> sort of feeling that they're out of control or they don't understand something or they're fearful about some sort of outcome. So. It is hard though, right, because m most clients probably don't want to admit that out of the gate or, or even on an ongoing basis. So while it might be true that there's some emotive reason that would sit underneath the hood of all of our decision making. Uh, that's not always something that everybody wants to be explicit about. <laughs> I, I don't always want to, you know, rock up into an office and say, "Well, I actually really want this because, well, Paul, because I'm really greedy," yes, and yeah. um, or you know, I don't want to make a decision about this, well, because I'm really fearful I'm going to make a mistake. Yep. You know, that's how are you seeing firms integrate those two things? Because it seems to me that you're right. If you don't address it at all, yep. that leaves a big gap. Yep. By the same token, I'm sure that if someone walked into an office and had a pure counselling session, yep. um, they might also feel like, well, actually, we're leaving some things out here that need to be done. Yes. Uh, it seems like we're landing somewhere in the middle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, have you got any thoughts yeah, on that? I think, I mean, most, most clients seeking advice typically have a problem 
in their mind. It's usually a problem they're trying to solve or you know, yeah. they've got some sort of complexity where they need they need help. And that seems quite straightforward. I Same for retirement. I want to pay off a mortgage. I want to help my kids or, or whatever it is. And it really then gets – the nub of it is the communication piece. So, it's really kind of understanding why those particular problems or challenges are important mm. to the person. So, part of it is – trying to get to know them as people and to get to know their personality, their mm. drivers, their values, their philosophies around other things in life. And it's the range of questions. I mean, there's, I've seen a lot of good techniques around kind of getting to the nub of what the problem is because, you know, if someone's coming to you with a problem they're trying to solve, if it's solved, how will that make them feel? And then if you can, if you can get to that feeling and reiterate that that feeling is of high value you're measuring progress very differently and i you know we've worked with business coaches over the years that talk about communication or, or so this is more question techniques it's um and and, and typically people um you know that they, they will lead you to the amount of information they require um you know you can start very high level with a concept as to why something might be important how you might solve a problem they will proceed typically um if they've got enough information if they're not fearful or if they trust you Typically, mm. yeah, they're kind of the three things that hold people people back from progress. Mm. And you can keep going deeper and deeper. So you can start with high level concepts, top of the iceberg type stuff, go a bit deeper, provide a bit more either qualitative and quant- quantitative um, information. And if they're still asking questions, it's one typically one of those three things that hasn't been met yet. And it'll be different drivers, and then keep keep going to a point where they've got no more questions. You know that that again gets rid of fear, gives them more information, builds builds trust. I think that that. That framework's very helpful for people because it gets to the nub of why, you know, why people are seeking advice, what's important to them, and then they can make decisions based on wherever they're comfortable. Not everyone's – some people will want the tip of the iceberg and they'll yeah. move on and others will want the detail. Yeah. I think the other thing that um, I've seen done very well with with some – in some firms, and 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 one of the other other podcasters um, that they, one of the guests was Dave Swan. He talks about you know the four S framework of communication, and it's finding different communication techniques to one deliver information, get feedback, you know, get progress. And you know we talk about stories, scripts, supplements, and sketches. They're all mm-hmm. different ways of conveying information. People absorb information differently. Mm. Um, you know, there's various various S's for want of a better word they're probably more effective than others so yeah. if you're trying to build trust quickly stories personal stories um, yeah. are really important and that can be personal stories as to why you're an advisor you know what led you down this path as a professional why do you want to help more people achieve the outcomes that they want but you can get people talking about their own personal story you know why are they seeing advice what was their you know family upbringing and their attitudes around money and savings and planning and all those sort of things and that can get to the nub of some kind of values and personal philosophies as well yeah and again people if they feel heard around that then again they more likely to so say this was a helpful conversation it's different to other conversations i've had with other advisors out in the marketplace yeah, look, I, I think that's a huge part of the value because one way we could frame this is to say, look, all of the answers are there on Google somewhere. Yep. Uh, so, it's not as if it's necessarily a lack of information. That's right. Because if someone had enough time, presumably they could go and find a form of an answer yep. <laughs> that they might need for that problem that they've yep. got in, in their mind. That's but right. the the value that advisors can bring, like you say, is to be able to find them wherever they're at and to communicate in a way that very quickly meets uh, and addresses that complexity Absolutely. in a way that they can actually move forward because there's right. no point, you know, just throwing in a whole stack of technical language. And I'd say conversely as well, if some if somebody, you know, really wants to understand some technicalities because that's important to them, that's, right. that's where you should begin. <laughs> that's right. I mean, we, we can talk to – you can put a very good plan in place and – you know, we can be meeting the financial objectives. The investment returns might be adequate enough to get clients where they need to get to. And that may be all all well and good and the plan's working. But if you can't convey why that's important to the client, they it may not take away any of the emotional things that they've come to you in the first place for. They might just want a sense of security, peace of mind and those sort of things. 10% return, you need to translate that for them. What does that mean? Yeah. You know, what 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 is that doing for, for my progress? Okay, if I'm progressing towards my goal, okay, that's a great thing. That's giving me confidence and I'm feeling less less anxious. So it's about it's about again going back to the problem and the emotions that are driving the relationship and the conversations and 
talking about what's happening from a quantitative or, or strategy perspective and then re- remembering the why. Why is this important to you and why are we focusing on this? But be also you know, creating a plan that is nimble enough to take into account um, changing circumstances because I think mm. – and that's important from the, from the outset – if clients understand that you're working with them, you, you're going to, going to be responsive to change and you're not constantly going to be having to change the plan, but it's robust enough to to uh, to adapt to different changes. Again, that gives them confidence because um, we know, one, there's personal circumstance that change. There's two, there's investment markets that go up and down yeah. and then there's legislation that change. There's, oh, a, whole, yeah. there's a lot of things that, that yeah. are going on in the background. <laughs> right? And I think, you know, if we think about the, the top five um, attributes of advice that advisors are looking for, and again, this came out of some of the studies that we we you know we ran, um, the number one thing you know clients want to know that you understand their financial goals, um, but also their emotional kind of attachment to those goals. Is this is this in rank order, or is this, this, this just this the, top the top five? five. Okay, um, typically, yeah, um, it could be a combination of these, or some might be important. One or two might be more important than others, but it's t- kind of typically these five. Um, they've got skills in communicating concepts in client-friendly ways. So again, mm-hmm. they want to they want to understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, responsiveness to requests for help, um, and this this kind of goes back to something I said earlier around. You can have systems and processes in place, and you might see clients three times a year, and two of them might be in person, one might be in Zoom. Clients might not want that. They might want to see you three times a year and they might want them all by Zoom or they might say, oh, I don't really want to see you unless it's a review, but I just want you to be available for questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of being a, you don't want to have too bespoke <laughs> because that's going to be challenging. You might be able to actually serve all your clients and you might be able to help them, but it's really kind of understanding um, that you're there for them should mm. things change or should they need advice. And, and yeah, typically right. the problems or challenges or anxieties in their mind are probably not as big as what they actually are and it's about being that soundboard and, and giving a different perspective um, as to what that means and again reconfirming that plan in place takes into account a lot of these changes right yeah and, of and, and, and fear and anxiety is quite normal and um, the other two are ability to instill a sense of security and that goes back to the number one thing about what is winning for clients mm-hmm. security and peace of mind mm-hmm. um, and then the final one is kind of personalized service that that's more of a challenging one everyone wants to be treated in a personalized way but if you've a wealth management firm you've got hundreds of clients you know you want to systemize the process you know, personalize the experience that that's a bit more challenging but it's doable and how is i'm curious how did you find that personalized service might be different to responsiveness to help so responsiveness to help is is listening and availability but presumably listening and availability yeah um Take yeah. a take a week to respond to an email. Bam, bam. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, table stakes these days are a lot more quicker than that. If we think about, you know, information is at our fingertips. You mentioned Google before. Yeah. If yeah. people ask a question, they you know they want an answer. Otherwise, they'll seek it. Somewhere it's a great else. tool, Paul. You should use it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll check out that on the weekend, maybe. Um, but yeah, so they want responsiveness. They want to feel as though when they ask a question you're not rediscovering anything you know them you know their circumstances yes, okay. and it could be a reconfirmation of something you've already discussed yeah um or it might be kind of articulating that the thing they're they're worried about is maybe not the problem that needs solving mm. um, so, so mm. it's looking at challenges and opportunities and in maybe, different ways and maybe something that money can't solve yeah, that's right. Because I think that can be a really helpful thing to be able to put it in yeah. its place sometimes and yeah. say, yeah, look, that, th- there is an issue here and the financial planning is actually not the, the yeah, thing. Yeah, that, that's right. And I think, um, you know, from an advisor experience point of view, if, if they can articulate to clients, you know, they've, they've seen these scenarios before, um, in these scenarios, what's worked and what hasn't, you know, because mm-hmm. often, I'm, I mean, you probably see it every now and then, clients probably come in with what they think the solution should be or could be or might be mm. based on the conversations they're having with friends, family, colleagues. Oh, the barbecue is a great place yeah, barbecue, for this. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, again, what exactly is the problem? Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I work with advisors. I, I don't work with any investors. You work with clients and... Um, I probably, I, I would imagine the discovery meetings can go in a whole bunch of different directions. It's like, okay, what, 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 once we map this out, what, where are we and what are we trying to achieve and, and, and what are their feelings and values around all this sort of stuff? Yeah, you know, I think that's really, you know, really important. And again, looking at challenges differently, you know, mm. I guess there's many, you know, there's probably different ways you can get to an outcome, but it's kind of rank ordering what's most important. Is it 
you know, and what's driving the decisions? Is it, is it lack of trust, lack of understanding? Is it fear? Is it, yeah, you know, lack of control or, or what, what have you? you yeah. Know, some of them aren't financial, really. It's, no, uh, you've got a trusted source and trusted relationship. I'm here to help and I'm here to ease that anxiety and yeah. whatever that may look like from a financial kind of standpoint. Yeah. But I mean, to sit in between those two worlds in some way is, is such an important part of the value. Yeah. Uh, I'm just sort of reminded of a conversation recently where um, there was a family who was looking at assisting, uh, you know, in a reasonably substantial way, assisting, uh, assisting their kids. Uh, there was, you know, three of them and they were sort of hesitating around one <laughs> yeah. and, you know, what behaviors might come from that. And, you know, the behaviors they were concerned about didn't strike me as the sort of real issue. Yeah. You know, they were talking about sort of, helping broader family members and, you know, the money sort of going outside of the family group and that sort of stuff, which didn't strike me as different to their values. But when we really sort of started to unpick it, it wasn't so much that. It was something entirely different Yes, um, within that family that was sort of causing a bit of angst. And, you know, so we realized actually it's got nothing to do with the number. It's got nothing to do with how much, you know, you might decide to help them out yeah it's got to do with something entirely different yeah. where you know we could we could change we could triple the number and it wouldn't change the yeah. issue and but you need to be able to sit in the middle of the, those two things yeah um to be able to help them work through it because otherwise where do they go you know it's a, this is hard stuff to deal with yeah i think it's a really good point and i think um you know the the span of advice out, out you know in, in the world you know working with people you know, there's a there's a big range you know there's there's true advisors and they they will have conversations and they'll 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 tell clients what they need to know or to know what's important and sometimes that's uncomfortable (laughs) and then you've got facilitators that will tell clients what they want to hear that that's probably not helping them solve the challenges you know it it may make for a nicer conversation yeah but you know (laughs) or easier (laughs) yeah and then shortly thereafter all the drivers of why they're getting advice are still there, you know, mm. the fear, anxiety or whatever it is. So, you know, getting to the nub of the challenges, the different personalities, the different drivers of oftentimes more than one person in the room um, and, and engendering the trust so you can you can provide advice and say, well, this is in my experience is to what I've seen work in this circumstance based on what I perceive as your challenges or issues to be. Um is helpful you know so it's like going to a doctor if you go to a doctor and you know if i i go and see my heart specialist i don't typically tell him what i think he should be doing um (laughs) and if i do profess something he doesn't just agree and go okay do that Um, yeah yeah, that that might make me feel good but it's certainly not going to help probably not long term i won't recommend that exactly so (laughs) you know and and he's very good at articulating various things we should be doing and and why they're important and there's personal accountability with that yeah he he doesn't follow me around 24 7 making sure i'm making the right decisions when it comes to heart health but (laughs) he's giving me enough information to go yeah this this is important and I understand why. Yeah, 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 excellent. And Paul, I understand that you've been sort of doing some work internally around putting these sort of big pieces together uh, at Dimensional. So you mentioned uh, the the business strategy side, oh, yep. the investment side, which is maybe the more standard for a fundy, if yes. I can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the the client communication relationship mm-hmm. side. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about? That work you've been drawing on all years of experience and, and putting it together, what, what does that look like now? On the client communication side? Is no, that, all, all those all, three things all together. All three together, yeah. I mean, I think it, the way that we think about that is, you know, we've had, you know, th- hundreds of thousands of conversations over the years around, um, you know, the investment piece, investment philosophies. How do we get clients to have a good investment experience and, and a good investment outcome? Mm-hmm. Um, focus on things you can control and that's very powerful for advisors when they're f- focusing on things they can control communicating those concepts and communicating in a way that again differentiates yourself as from other advisors in the marketplace but helps give clients that sense of peace of mind and understanding you know where they're going to where they're coming from and and giving them again the knowledge to make the right decisions um it's it's what we found particularly through challenging times in investment markets so it's Mm. kind of it's related right so we need to have an investment conversation but there's also education around what investment 
journeys can look like. Oh, yeah. One a better word. Yeah. Um, you know, we can do all the forecasts in the world and say the market goes up 7% a year and it's all of a straight line. But, you know, there's, we know that's not the case, but then we also know there's lots of other inputs into clients' um, mindsets. You know, there's, there's the media, there's articles, there's people they're talking to, there's the barbecue conversation, mm-hmm. and they all have different time horizons and different drivers. So we know the media kind of work on a 24-hour cycle. Um, mm. They're going to talk about what's relevant in any given day and try to get eyeballs and people talking. That's the polar opposite to a client's experience of getting advice, which spans decades. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of techniques around, you know, understanding what's interesting versus what's important. There's a lot yeah. of interesting things in the media and some of them might be important for a particular client circumstance. Most of them aren't. Yeah. Um, so, everyone can listen to the media and talk to their friends and it's okay to have an opinion. But that doesn't mean you should act on it. You know, your plan, your financial plan's there for a reason. It takes all of those things into account and your own personal circumstance. So that's that's a critical part. And so yeah. helping, you know, we help the advisory community we, we work with really articulate what are the things that you should be concentrating on when it comes to an investment, a good investment outcome. One of them is listening or otherwise to the media. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And some techniques around that. So how do you how do you See things that are interesting rather important and then not act on things that might deem to be interesting but are very unhelpful when it comes to achieving long-term goals. And again, that, that comes back to educating clients, mm. getting them to understand why why are these things interesting to you and it's perfectly fine to, for them to be interesting but it doesn't mean you need to act on them. It mm. means also having a, a robust financial plan but also a plan that's nimble enough to take into account changing circumstances that affect them yeah. rather than what's going on out in the world. Absolutely. And I mean, that dovetails really well into what you were saying about measuring measuring what matters Absolutely. In, in a sense. And I've always thought that that would be one thing uh, that if I could just magically sort of take the USB stick out of my head and, and put it into any client or, or, or anyone who wanted to sort of do better in their own financial world, it would be the ability to benchmark well. Yes, <laughs> know, absolutely. You know, because it I think that's that's the hard part, you know, right? Like his clients will open up a, you know, a newspaper and say, great, like what was the top performing super fund? And, th- yep. and if this was any other domain of life, like you know what to do. You've got a bunch of yep. data. You look for the best data. You go pick that data and yep. away you go. Yeah. Um, but that's that's not how investment markets work. Yeah. And to help people appreciate some of those nuances and just how to track how you're going – you know, what are the parts that you're doing really well in? What are the parts that you're doing badly in? Yeah. Um, what does your financial setup look like? Yeah. And maybe compared to other people is sometimes helpful and sometimes appropriate. Sometimes maybe not so much. But, yes. you know, if you could help people do that well, I mean, that's just a massive, massively valuable thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, benchmarking is an interesting one. I think, you know, when you're doing an asset allocation, selecting fund managers or, or, or selecting other investments, you need to be able to measure if they're being successful compared to some sort of benchmark or, or their peers. That, mm. That's one thing. So you you want to you want to try to build a proposition that's not based on guesswork and forecasting those sort of things. That being said, though, the most important benchmark is the, the client. I mean, what does the client need? If if mm. the client only needs three percent a year, well, that's kind of their benchmark. They don't. But need, what do they want, Paul? This is the topic. Well, that, that, <laughs> what do right. they want? You know, they, they they want to know that they're yeah. they're they're meeting their goals. They're mm. they're progressing. And if you tell them a three percent, ten percent, and they don't really understand what they need, you know, part of the job is you know, based on what you're trying to achieve and all the things that we've set in place. Three percent will do it for you. Yeah. So yeah, that that's what you should be benchmarking. You, not what markets are doing, or not what your friends getting, or not what the best funds doing out there what's important to you is to progress against your goals if you get your progress you'll be feeling less anxious you'll be feeling more in control you'll be more confident you'll be happier to speak to the advisor around things that are potentially changing and yeah. you'll do that probably closer to when they're changing rather than after the fact yeah um, and again all those things make for a way better outcome for the client so again it's it's what's important to the client and what do all these things mean for the client yeah. and their context rather uh-huh. than just headline headline topics concepts or numbers and i think even being able to close the gap between what somebody actually needs and what they want and yeah. be a bit more explicit about that yeah, yeah. is wildly helpful because well, that goes both ways you know like you said it might yeah. be that you only need three percent a year 
to do all the things you might reasonably expect you're going to want to do with money yeah. between now and when you die. Yeah. I mean, that that's something you can put into Excel pretty easily. Absolutely. But it's understandable that some people might still want more than yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. And equally, some people might actually only want to shoot for, well, you know, I only want, you know, interest from term deposits. Well, you know, we might have some bad news for you. You might actually need a lot more than that yeah. if you want to do X, Y, and Z that you've already told us. Yes. All those sorts of things. So, even just being able to close the gap between what yeah. they actually need and what they actually want yes. <laughs> is a big part. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to the point I made earlier about being a true advisor versus a facilitator. You know, sometimes sure. yeah. Yeah, an advisor will tell people what they need to know and what the ramifications are rather mm. than what they want to hear. Mm. Yeah. So, so your heart specialist ain't going to roll with it when you say you just want to go to France and eat, you know, rolls and rolls of brie exactly. and, uh, you know, try to do a triathlon. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Exactly, exactly <laughs> right. So it's, it's about having those, it's about having those conversations with someone that you trust that kind of gets what you're trying to achieve. And then, you know, if, if, if you, if those clients are bringing stuff to you, that's perfectly fine. But again, tell him why or why not, you know, not, not, not how we should do this, but why, why is this in line or not? You know, or is it out of step with the plan we've got in place? Or, mm. you know, we're going down paths that we're, we're losing control of what we're, we're trying to achieve. Let's focus on things that are within our control because we're more likely to get the outcomes we want than, you know, um, injecting things that, you know, we're relying on on things out, outside of our immediate, you know, area of expertise or otherwise. Mm. So it's certainly evolving. Um, again, this is this is thirty years in the making. You know, things have, have changed. I, I've been in the financial services, you know, sector for twenty five years, I'm gonna say, and you know, make sure he's fourteen at, at, at dimensional. But um, you know, it just it's evolved a lot in forty, but it's certainly evolved over twenty five years, and and it's evolving again. And and things that were cutting edge ten years ago are kind of table stakes when it comes to you know communicating with clients now. Um, and it's it's the next evolution where you know, advisors will differentiate themselves and provide different value. And I'd lo- I'd love to get your read on this because you've got such a long history. You've seen how things have evolved, and yeah, like you say, there's uh, th- there's things which were maybe new and flashy and might be a you know proposition of difference. Yeah, uh, but might not be anymore. Yeah, uh, because things have moved on and the industry's caught up and it's professionalized. Yeah, you know what, what's your sense of where this is going? Um, if you look at the maybe, I don't know if you want to use examples from really leading firms that you think, oh wow, these guys have really got it together. This is the future of the profession. This is where everyone's got to catch up to. Yeah, I can talk to what what we're seeing, and it's not it's not very advanced, but people are certainly thinking about. So we talk about holistic advice. You know, we're kind of there. We're in holistic advice, but they're taking that to the next level. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back in time to get to where we are now. And if I think so, if you just think about investing specifically in this mm-hmm. point in time, if you think about investing fifty years ago, probably sixty years ago, there was not much science to it. There wasn't a lot of data, so people would pick a few stocks and kind of hope for the best. Yep. And that's all they could do. That that was perfectly fine. There was kind of no other options. Yeah. Um, as the industry evolved, you know, sometime thereafter, you know, it was the formation of indexes. So you could invest into an index. So yep. that didn't require a couple of stocks or stock picking. There was kind of a bit more rigor around investing in the market. And then that's evolved through more financial science and really understanding where returns come from and how to build portfolios around different different parts of the market and get different returns and those sort of things. So there's been a real evolution and that's based on more information, more data, more technology. And yeah. so that, that, that's evolved over time. So the kind of table stakes now is kind of more understanding how to build portfolios and those sort of things. That's kind of the start point. If you kind of think about medicine takes the same path, you go back 100 years and there's a lot of guesswork. Are you sick? How can we fix it? Not really sure, but try this. Give it a go. Yeah. Give it a go and <laughs> try some sort of tonic. Then they become more scalable treatment. You could there's antibiotics and there's kind of more information around nutrition. So it was about, you know, you can treat disease but try to be a bit healthier. And and now a lot of it's kind of preventative medicine. So it's about how do we you know, we we know what to eat, we know how to exercise, there's plenty of medical tests we can go to make sure that, you know, everything's in order and we can and maintain it. So, you know, medicine's evolved just with technology and 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 and, and people doing, you know, discovering new things. And I think wealth management's the same. But it was kind of you think 30, 40 years is kind of product led. Yeah, of what course. Products are there out there to help you know people get an outcome they want. 
that then that then evolved into kind of more asset allocation, more holistic advice. It was not just product, but you know, what are the other things that we can deliver as as a whole holistic financial planning wealth management firm? And there was your insurances, estate planning, cash flow, budgeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the kind of where, where we've got to now, and that's and now that's table stakes. I mean, most of the financial planning firms that you know we deal with are doing that sort of stuff and, and doing it very well. But it, it's the next evolution is really it's that. But how how you know, we think about pro, you know, progressing 30, 40 years and, and forecasting 30, 40 years and putting a plan in place so you can achieve all the goals and live the life you want. That's all well and good if you're healthy and and you've got all the other things that people want to do in retirement that we know are important and it's having hobbies, that's having a good community around you, it's yep. being able to live your values, it's having a community, a support network or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's yeah. about that holistic wealth management but kind of keeping a focus on all of that sort of stuff too so you know you do get to live the life that you want not just in a financial sense but everything else that comes with it so we see value, uh, we see value propositions starting to spring up around that that type of concept so it's partnering with not only lawyers accountants and various other financial um, and professional services but community groups you know um, hobby um, social and hobby groups so you know people can l- leverage those if they're important and so it's really about living your financial life and your own personal goals and values and bringing it all together all right advisors that are kind of going down that path of thinking about it in, in a number of ways kind of five or six that that we've seen and again it's very formative but i think you know if we have this conversation in 10 years' time, probably a lot of people are doing it. And yeah, it's maybe. Forward, but yeah. you know, they, they, they're championing overall well-being. So not just getting financial house in order and getting there and keeping it there forever. It's, well, how do we do all the other things around that that mean we can enjoy what we're planning for? We can be fit, have a community, have, have hobbies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they urge personal responsibility. So it's not just a set and forget. It's We know that any, any coaching, you know, you can – play tennis the coach can tell you how to hit the ball but unless you practice it you're not going to get any better health professionals they can tell you how to be healthy but unless you're doing the exercise yeah so they urge personal responsibility they urge people to go out and keep doing their hobbies keep having community around you and all those things that we know are, are, are positive for people you know as they head towards or through their retirement they fight for every dollar they walk their talk so they they're living those sort of lives themselves it's really an alignment of their financial lives with their personal lives and values. They're guided by financial science and they're committed to staying at the top of their game. So, you know, they're not resting on their laurels. They're getting business coaches. They're, you know, finding other means by which they can deliver what they want to deliver in a differentiated way. Mm -hmm. That encompasses all these other things that we've been talking about. And I think it's around – it's really an alignment of, you know, what – What's your own pur- purpose and philosophy around various things, and how do you marry that up with your financial, financial life and philosophy, and trying to kind of live it in its entirety? So I think that's where we see it going. Um, that's where we see firms kind of what they're thinking about. Some of them are, some of the ideas are a bit esoteric, but I think they will become table stakes down the track. Yeah, um, right. Okay. So, you know, there's. There's some interesting books around this sort of stuff. Around you know, think about preventative medicine. It's about longevity, but it's about having a healthy, healthy longevity. You know, we want to plan that last forty years. We also want a life that can enjoy that forty years. Um, and and so I think that's probably the next evolution, um, and that will pivot and that will change. But you know, people are looking for that, and advisors are offering that, um, and and they're working through what that looks like for their own value proposition. Yeah. And I'm sure as part of that, I mean, that's a different set of skills in a lot of ways, or it's certainly a big enhancement on maybe some of the skills that are already there Yeah, uh, to be able to deliver that well. Yeah. It's, it's, think, it's kind of easy to say at some level, but yeah, it's not necessarily it, an easy thing to, to deliver. Yeah, I think it goes back to some of the concept we talked about at the top of this conversation around really understanding the driver's of clients so understanding what's important to them what they're Mm. seeking in advice what that looks like for them but a whole other range of questions around values personal philosophy etc etc and then building services um, or referral partners around that yeah Um, so we do often often you know we do talk about what's important to you and family and safety and security and all that sort of stuff it's kind of the next evolution of that how do you want to live your life 
what are the hobbies that are important? How do you build a community? Do you have a community? Yes, I do. That's good. Do you have – if you don't, well, what can we do for you? Because we know that's going to be important for you to have a healthy and happy longer life. So, yeah, it's it's evolving, but it's certainly, one, asking the right questions, two, getting to the number of what's important from a, you know, from a philosophical values point of view and then thinking, well, what are the services that – I can provide or where can I introduce people that can can help me you know, serve my client better yeah yeah absolutely because I it would seem at least from my perspective that maybe you know there's been a push and maybe a greater acceptance of delving a little bit deeper uh, maybe to start with for, for those client relationships to, yep. to build trust and all that sort of thing but I, I certainly get the sense around the industry that a lot of people don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, absolutely. three years down the track, you go, okay, great. Well, you said all these things are important. We feel like we're really well connected and you, you know what's uh, it's going on. But then, you know, what do you, how do you then introduce a way of integrating, you know, a comment like, you know, oh, th- things are things are really tough with with mum and dad at the moment yep. and you know I, I you know they're they're aging and yep. you know we're trying to find w- what to do next i don't know how long they're going to be able to stay at home yep. you know those sorts of things where you where you hit the tensions of real life yes yeah absolutely <laughs> it's not just us sitting around being like oh wow we can all sort of swan around and go from yep. our kayaking club to you know a morning coffee and just i don't know whatever yep. your retirement yep. dream looks like you know there's there's really tough stuff too yeah i mean that and i think that goes back to the the quality of advice and and there's the blind spots we spoke about you know if you perhaps if you're in your 30s or 40s or 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 whatever you know you're maybe not thinking about you know aging or elderly parents but but bringing that to the table for people and saying you know what what would happen you know have you got siblings would they help you know what's your personal values around and family values around that sort of Mm. stuff so it's about you know bringing to light things now that might be important that may not not seem important now but but certainly do require some sort of planning but again that holistic conversation around that well these are all the things that i've seen as an advisor for people like you in your circumstance that end up having this as a pretty important factor in them one achieving what they want to achieve but two upholding their own values and other things that that they're going to have to do so yeah and again planning earlier for that sort of stuff's probably important i mean you can bring it to light now it doesn't mean you have to do anything about it now no, no, no. but it makes that conversation easier down the track and and particularly when you're building a plan around it that you know that that's going to be there at some point perhaps. yeah it takes away the element of surprise too, that's right right if, if, if you're walking with someone who's got a ton of other experience yeah. then you know, you yeah. don't feel like you have to rely on this stuff like you're the only one that it's ever happened to. <laughs> exactly. And, and, know, and yeah. I mean, that goes back to, you know, something I said earlier, one, you know, one of the ways people choose advice is, have you worked with people like me before? Do you mm. understand people like me before? And, you know, bringing that to light. So Excellent. Yeah. Um, Paul, as we sort of draw things to a close, I mean, you've covered off so many sort of wonderful and interesting parts of learnings that you have seen uh, th- through your work. Is there anything that really stands out to you personally as something that you think uh, either about where you got a lot of conviction about where this is going? I, I can already sense that yeah. you've got some <laughs> yeah. got yeah. some ideas about that, um, or or something that you feel that maybe advisors regularly miss or regularly regularly sort of demonstrate some blind spots of our own in in how we deal with that and create more value f- yes. in our client relationships? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I do think about this a lot. I do talk to a lot of advisors and I have my team talk to a lot of advice firms. We're in a relationship game and we always will be. I think com- the communication piece is uh, still to me the most critical thing. The, 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 one that the, the second question you asked me is, um, I think people know what to do and they know what clients value and they know the value they bring to clients. But under times you duress and when it's busy, we tend to fall back into practices that we know aren't very helpful. And that's being pot- potentially formulaic in what we're trying to deliver. Mm-hmm. It's being, I was going to say lazy, I don't want to call, put anyone offside, but lazy language, right. uh, which is more advice profession language than client centric language sure and it's then also concentrating on the how we're going to get things done rather than why are we doing things i think if we go back 
wealth management 20 years ago, 10 years ago now or 10 or 20 years in the future, I think those those issues will still be there. So I think having a very deliberate communication strategy, be, be very clear around the words and phrases you use, the benefit your practice brings or your wealth management firm brings, so the value proposition in a way that differentiates yourself helps people understand the benefits that they they're going to achieve are they going to um, they're going to uh, get from working with you and how you differentiate from other people and then day-to-day checking into the personal progress about feelings like a is this meeting all the your needs and objectives as we said at the, at the at the top of this one if you're feeling fear anxiety um, confusion stress are those things have they dissipated? Yeah, and if they are, that means I think your communication's probably pretty good. Yeah, if they start to <laughs> surface again, we've probably moved away from the things communicating around the things that are important to the client and and the feelings that they're trying to either alleviate or progress towards. So alleviate stress, progress towards a sense of peace of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Paul, thank you so much for sharing your your thoughts and uh, and wisdom with with me and the audience. We really appreciate you coming along. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Paul. Speak soon.